Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is the skimming property of bargaining. I discuss this and other things in Chapter 7 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. Check the video description for more information about that. To quickly recap where we are on this unit of bargaining and uncertainty, what we've seen previously is if bargaining works, the parties will reach a deal immediately. In other words, we've only looked at situations where I make you an offer, and that offer is an accept or reject, and that's the end of it. If you accept it, then we have a deal that's made, and if you reject it, we're never dealing with each other ever again. But this misses out on an important empirical phenomenon. What we observe sometimes in the real world is something like this. You and I are negotiating over some sort of contract. We sit down at a table. I say, here are the terms that I would like you to sign. I give you a piece of paper with the contract. You read it over. You think to yourself, you know what? I don't actually like this. Let's talk about this a little bit later. So you're rejecting that initial offer, but you're not walking away from the bargaining process entirely. Then later on, maybe it's a few days, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a little bit longer than that, we come back to the bargaining table, we negotiate again, we maybe see some movement in the offer that's being made, and we reach an agreement then. So we see delay sometimes occurring in a bargaining process, and we don't have an explanation for that so far. But what we're going to see in this lecture is that the skimming property gives us an explanation for why this occurs empirically. So thinking about these models that we've looked at previously, again, we're looking at situations with bargaining and incomplete information. In other words, there's some sort of facet about you that's important to the bargaining process that I'm unaware of or I'm not sure about. And what we've seen previously is that if I think that you're very likely to be a weak type, in other words, a type that is willing to accept smaller offers, then I'm going to propose a small offer to you. If you are, in fact, a weak type, you accept it. And if you're a strong type, you reject the offer and we don't have a deal being made. And I'm okay with that happening. In other words, I'm okay that I might have bargaining fail because I am going to be getting a very good offer by having the weak type accept, and it's such a good offer that I'm willing to incur some sort of loss as a result of these strong types rejecting these offers and walking away from the bargaining process entirely. But there's an open question here. Why not renegotiate with the rejectors? In other words, if you and I are bargaining, I make an offer to you, you reject it, well, now I'm thinking to myself, geez, this guy is walking away from the bargaining table, Maybe I was being a little bit too strict with the deal that I was offering. Maybe it was being very, very not generous with the offer. And maybe I should go renegotiate with the individual that just rejected with me or rejected my offer because there is money being lost in the relationship by us not having a contract be signed. Well, you should realize immediately that there's a problem with immediately renegotiating these sorts of deals. If renegotiation were to happen immediately, then we would not actually have those weak types accepting smaller offers. Think about this. If you are a weak type that accepted an offer, it's getting a small amount initially, right? And if these stronger types are rejecting the offers and then immediately getting a better offer, then there's nothing that stops the weak type from rejecting the initial offer and then immediately getting an offer that's much greater, right? If it's so easy for you to just say, you know what, give me more money right now because I'm walking away, then there's no reason for the weak type to be receiving a small offer initially, or at least not to be accepting that small offer if the proposer makes such an offer to the weak type. So if you want to be able to separate types, if you're a proposer and you want a weak type to be accepting a smaller deal and a strong type to be accepting a larger deal, in other words, you want to force that weak type to only get a smaller amount, you can't have these renegotiations occur immediately. There has to be some sort of time delay, like I talked about in that hypothetical example, where if you reject a contract in the real world, we might not be renegotiating this immediately. We might be taking a week or so to think about this and then meet up again and then negotiate the contract at that point. So if we have a system that works like that, where stronger types are waiting out a delay, this process, this delay process, proves their strength. In other words, if you're a strong type, for whatever reason, you're better able to weather a period where negotiations are failing, 
Uh, maybe one example of this is that we are in labor negotiations, and for some reason, your labor force has been able to store away some cash reserves to make sure that your employees that you're uh, working for as the labor union are going to be taken care of for some time during a failed negotiation. Well, you can survive this delay in a way that these weaker types that don't have these accesses or that don't have the access to these cash reserves cannot. So only after a delay do I, as the proposer, know that you have proven yourself to be the stronger type, and I increase my offer at that point. So this is what the skimming property is getting at. To skim is to offer a small amount initially and then gradually increase offers as time passes where the stronger types are now credibly revealing their strength, they're signaling their resolve in these negotiations to get a better deal, and I am uh, appropriately giving them extra compensation for that. Now, under these conditions, these weak types are accepting early because they know they will have to wait a long time to get a better deal. And the stronger types, by definition of being a stronger type, can wait it out because they can hold out better by definition. So even if you're a weak type under these circumstances where skimming is going on, you know that you're able to reject an offer now and get a larger offer later on, but you're not going to be doing this because the offer that's being put in front of you is structured in a way that accepting it now is better than delaying, suffering during that period where there's no deal being made at all, and getting a little bit more later on. Now, it's important to note that there are some efficiency implications here. The outcome of a skimming process is still inefficient. That's because you only have these weakest types accepting immediately, and stronger types are rejecting. This rejection causes delay, and delay is inefficient. So think about this. If you're a stronger type, then maybe you're waiting like a month to sign a contract with me. And so during that month-long period where we're not having a deal be made, what we could be doing instead is taking the ultimate negotiated outcome that we're going to have a month from now and implement it immediately. And because we have implemented it immediately, we're both benefiting from that extra month of economic transaction in a way that we wouldn't be if there was this delay. But we can't have that happen immediately because we have these weaker types floating around, and if I'm a proposer and I think that you're likely to be this weaker type, I would rather instigate this delay process and have an inefficiency occur with the stronger types because I can get a better deal out of the weaker types for myself by offering a small amount immediately. Now, on the other hand, the inefficiency today preserves efficiency tomorrow. So there is some efficiency benefits here accruing as a result of having negotiations that take place on a repeated process. So in these one-shot games that we've been looking at previously, if you rejected, then there was no deal ever going to be made, and so there was a lot of inefficiency occurring there. And in the contrast here, where we have a rejection being made initially, but a deal ultimately being made later on, we're seeing efficiency from that point forward where the deal is being made. So just because there is inefficiency through rejection, that doesn't mean we have complete inefficiency because we have a deal eventually being made. So to quickly give you an understanding of how this arises substantively, you know, this is something that I think should, as I've alluded to throughout this, this lecture today, uh, you have, should have some sort of familiarity with if you've ever looked at strikes. So in strikes where there's a business and some sort of unionized labor force in that business, that business might be offering a small amount to those employees initially saying, you know, here's the deal. I'm going to offer you $12 an hour to work at this, this place that I'm employing you. And if you're a weaker type that is desperate to make a deal, if you're a union that needs to have a deal be made immediately or all of your employees are going to be in, in a bad situation where they're not going to be able to, I don't know, even say eat for a while, then those types are going to be uh, accepting immediately, and those stronger types that can actually hold out for a little bit longer have this costly delay occur where we're not working and there's no employment going on, so there's inefficiency, 
But then later on, we come back to the bargaining table. There are better offers being made. And maybe now that better offer being made is something that the labor union is willing to accept. And if maybe the labor union is really, really, really tough and really strong and very well equipped to weather a strike, maybe that labor union rejects that offer and we have steps two and three repeating until we finally see resolution. Now, again, what's going on here with this delay, as we've seen, is that these types that are in desperate need to get a deal are actually the ones that are getting the worst deals, which has this unfortunate implication here that if you're starving, then you're getting the worst deal possible. And that's that's not good. Obviously, that's that's quite unfortunate, but that's just how this bargaining process works. So there's an example with strikes. And in the book, I talk about a few other implications here, a few other substantive examples. Uh, we talk about uh, the U.S. government shutdown in 2013. You might remember that over the tax debt ceiling if you lived in the United States. We talk about how that bargaining failure actually ultimately led to an agreement being made. Uh, similarly, also in 2013, Time Warner Cable took off CBS from its airwaves, and there was a bargaining process between Time Warner Cable and CBS that eventually led to an agreement and CBS being brought back on. Talk about that in the book. And then there are a couple of other examples in the book that are a little bit different than what we've seen uh, in this lecture here, war and lawsuit settlements. What makes war and lawsuit settlements a little bit different in skimming is that the process of war and the process of taking a lawsuit to trial not only reveals information by virtue of the delay of having having a deal not be made today and going through a costly process to hopefully reach a deal later on, the actual process of going through the negotiations, the rejected negotiations, that means fighting battles in war or going through a lawsuit and actually having evidence being revealed in court, that also provides additional information which can help resolve these bargaining tensions and lead to an agreement that wouldn't have existed previously. So that's the skimming property. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.